All my life, I've been terrified, fascinated, profoundly curious about epidemics, how they spread, how they kill, and how we can stop them. And this passion led me to my career. I'm not a doctor or a nurse on the front line, but I'm a scientist and a teacher at the best university in the world, who, <laughs> who, who has always loved mathematics and using math to solve real world problems. And that's exactly what we do in my lab here at UT. Working with a large number of undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, faculty colleagues, we use math and statistics and high performance computing to address three basic questions. Where are diseases spreading today? Where will they spread tomorrow? And how can we stop them? So the first question, where are diseases spreading today? Well, disease surveillance systems are designed to detect and track diseases all around the globe as quickly and accurately as possible. Traditionally, public health agencies like the CDC have relied on doctors and hospitals to basically tell them what they're seeing. For example, this is a map of the US's influenza surveillance system. Each of those spots represents a doctor or clinic, a hospital that reports to the CDC every single week how many cases of flu they treated. These systems work well. We use them for lots of diseases, but they could work better. You can see from this map that there are geographic gaps in coverage, and we find that particularly in socioeconomically challenged areas. And then there are critical time lags between when somebody becomes infected, gets sick enough to go to the doctor, the doctor actually writes up the report, submits it to the CDC, the CDC actually processes and analyzes it. It can be days or even weeks between that initial infection and the CDC realizing that infection took place, and meantime, the outbreak has continued to spread. Well, all that is about to change. Thanks to the information explosion of the 21st century, disease surveillance is undergoing a revolution. Very soon, public health agencies will be able to see in real time who's walking into every emergency department in the country and with what symptoms. Already, we can see who is searching for uh, disease-related terms in Google. The scenario is you get sick, someone you know, get, knows gets, you know gets sick, and you search, you search for information. So Google, in 2009, actually came up with this brilliant idea. Why don't we track how many people are searching for disease-related terms as a proxy for actually tracking the infections? And sure enough, in this graph up here, what you see in blue is how many people are searching for flu-related terms on Google, and in gold are the actual number of flu cases according to CDC surveillance. The correspondence is remarkable, except that this breaks down as soon as an outbreak hits the news. When an outbreak hits the news, Everybody is Googling for information, not just the people that are sick. And you could see this, this took place in the early, in April of 2009, when the 2009 H1N1 pandemic uh, hit the news, then everyone was searching for information, and not that many people were sick yet. Despite this limitation, the prospects of using digital data are very exciting, and already we're mining Google, and Twitter, and Facebook, and Wikipedia, and uh, we're, my, we're looking at all the news publications around the globe, and we're even getting people to voluntarily enter their personal health information on websites that track diseases. All of these are contributing to our, our ability to do surveillance. And in my lab at UT, we work closely with public health agencies at the state of Texas, the CDC, Department of Defense, to help them improve traditional surveillance and figure out how to harness this gold mine of digital data so that we can track and detect diseases even more effectively. We've developed a really powerful method to do this that harnesses the supercomputers at the Texas Advanced Computer Center, TAC, our supercomputer center here in town, to conduct head-to-head -head competitions between different data streams to see which ones or which combinations of data are going to do the best job at detecting and monitoring diseases. And using this method, we've improved surveillance for flu around the country, and we've also improved surveillance for two very important vector-borne diseases, dengue and chikungunya, these are two diseases that impose a major public health burden in Central and South, and South America. And you may have heard of them recently because they're starting to move upward. They're starting to move north, and we're seeing our first cases in the southern states of the United States, with more to come, certainly. For Ebola, we're at the cutting edge of using uh, genomic data from the virus itself to try to reconstruct the early transmission patterns. That's what you see in this image here. The circles represent some of the first cases in Sierra Leone, and the connections between those circles, the arrows, 
show the chains of transmission that we were able to reconstruct by looking at the genomic data. Question two, where will diseases be tomorrow? When I wake up in the morning, I open my iPad, I check the weather, hoping for rain. Where do those beautiful and detailed forecasts come from? Well, they come from really complex mathematical models that are born out of centuries and even millennia of climate science that are made possible by the abundant volumes and volumes of data coming from satellites and weather stations positioned all around the globe and from massive supercomputers that are dedicated just to crunching the numbers for weather. Compared to weather forecasting, disease forecasting is in its infancy. So where does the CDC come up with a forecast that there may be 1.4 million cases of Ebola by January 20th? Well, we do know something about how diseases spread, and we've been, we've been studying it for centuries now. If you can tell us how the disease spreads, is it waterborne, is it foodborne, does it spread via mosquitoes, or does it spread through direct contact with bodily fluids like Ebola? If you can tell us how contagious it is, how long between becoming infected and then becoming contagious to others. We can take those quantities, those rates, put them into mathematical equations that do a pretty good job of telling us how an outbreak is going to unfold. How quickly will the number of cases increase? When will the outbreak peak? When will it subside? The difficulty is, though, we often don't know what those inputs into the equations are. The current e Ebola outbreak is a perfect example of this. This is an unprecedented outbreak. We've never seen one this big. We've never seen one this urban. The cases we're seeing may only be a slice of the outbreak. There may be many more cases out there that, we're not, that, that are not being reported. And there may be some people who are being exposed to Ebola, not actually getting sick, but being immunized so that they, they are then protected against future infection. Because of all these un unknowns and several other unknown factors, we have to take the recent forecasts with an enormous grain of salt. And if anything, I think maybe the recent forecasts are, are over-projecting how much Ebola we're going to see in the coming months. So if it's so hard to forecast Ebola and we don't know the inputs, where should we start? How can we start getting good at forecasting, forecasting diseases? Well, one good place to start is with influenza. We have decades and decades of experience and data from which to learn. And in fact, last year, the CDC held a predict the flu competition. It galvanized 20 of the best research groups, both in academia at the best universities in the country and in the high tech industry to put their fanciest models, best data, superest computers to work at trying to forecast four things. When is the season going to start? When is the season going to peak? How many people will be infected with the flu at that peak? And when will the season subside? And in the four or five months of the contest, a new field was born. And new methods were developed and improved. And we had an enormous amount of progress with 20 of the best groups in the country all fighting to do well. Well, the work has only just begun. Here is an example of one of the typically fairly good forecasts that came out of the contest in green. We do pretty good at predicting the beginning and the end of the season, but despite all we know about flu, we do still quite a lousy job of figuring out when the season's going to peak and how high that peak is going to be. So it's an exciting and quickly moving endeavor, and we're always looking for quantitatively minded students to help us and join in the effort. Let's turn to the third question and final question. How can we stop deadly outbreaks? And specifically, how can we use math to help us? Well, unlike other areas of science, understanding the spread and control of infectious diseases is hindered by an inability to conduct controlled experiments. I can never go out and test whether vaccinating one age group is going to save more lives than vaccinating another age group, because I'm certainly not going to introduce a deadly disease or even withhold potentially life-saving interventions during a naturally occurring outbreak. Computer models, mathematical models, allow us to conduct the kinds of experiments virtually that we would like to do in the real world but can't do in the real world. For example, this is a video of a model that we developed in the early days of the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. What you see is a deadly strain of flu spreading across the United States. 
As cases increase, you see these pie charts turn green. When infected people travel from one city to another, you see a red line arc across the country. And if you squint, you might see little purple bars next to some of these big cities, representing how many drugs are available and showing how they're being depleted as doctors are prescribing them to save their patients' lives. We developed the model that you see here when we were working with the federal government to address a very time-sensitive question in the very first few weeks of this epidemic, this pandemic. And the question was, how do we use our strategic national stockpile of antiviral medications to slow the pandemic and save lives until we can develop a vaccine? At the time, there were 80 million courses of the drug, and we needed to figure out how best to use those to protect a population of 300 million people. And so what we did, again, using the supercomputers at TAC, was we, we built a model and very rapidly evaluated hundreds of mi millions of possible distribution schedules. And we were able to provide for the federal government recommendations for which sorts of schedules would be most effective, and we were able to effectively communicate what our model was assuming and why the different schedules might play out in different ways using this kind of visualization software. In this way, we were able to help inform some critical decision-making at the highest levels in a really time-sensitive situation. Since 2009, my lab has developed a whole toolkit of web-based decision support tools that are available to the state of Texas and to policymakers across the country to help them decide, figure out how best to use limited resources to, to save lives and slow the spread of outbreaks. For example, how best to use uh, vaccines or drugs, um, how best to use limited hospital resources like personnel or ventilators to save lives in, in the ICU, and when and where to use what we call non-pharmaceutical interventions, like when should we close schools to slow an outbreak. What you see in this picture, this photo here, is one of my former graduate students demoing the software in the TAC visualization lab, which is right, on, right here on campus in the Peter O'Donnell building. And in the audience, there are representatives from the CDC and the NIH who are, who are, who are um, checking out our sophomore who came to Austin, our sophomore. And if you haven't been to this university gem, if you haven't seen the visualization lab, you should go and check it out. In this lab, there are walls of high-definition monitors, and researchers of all stripes use it to get critical visual insight into their systems, from the inside of an artery to the entire cosmos. Finally, I will leave you with an example of how we've used mathematical modeling to save lives and save money on the other side of the globe. In Zimbabwe, there are over 1.2 million people infected with HIV. There is a waterborne parasite called schistosomiasis. When women and girls are infected with schistosomiasis, it makes it, them more likely to become infected with HIV. So we asked the question of whether or not treating people for schistosomiasis would be an effective way to slow the HIV epidemic. We built a mathematical model that captured the complex interplay between these two diseases, and we found that even though mass treatment of school-aged children for schistosomiasis is very expensive up front, in the long run, over 10 years, it's expected to prevent 80,000 new HIV infections and save 63 million US dollars. In this era of global change, of emerging and re-emerging deadly diseases, access to good information, rational decision-making, go hand in hand with our desperate need for new drugs and vaccines. And the kinds of modeling and data analysis that I described to you today really can help to save lives, particularly when researchers build strong collaborative bridges with public health. And as more curious and innovative students like yourselves take up this charge, the world will benefit. So thank you very much, and thanks to the many people who are involved in these efforts and to the funding agencies who make this work possible.